All right, guys, in the last video, I said that we're going to be up the creek without a paddle, and I hope that maybe our little pH probes can be our paddles in our little buffer boats that we're swimming in in pH theory. But I also said that in the next video, we're going to have to talk about some extra problems that can happen uh, if we're not really careful and we just don't really know what we're doing when we use a pH probe. And I've said there were three major ones, and here they are. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, so the very first one, we're going to call a sodium or acid error. And then the next one, we're going to call an equilibrium error. And in the third one, we're going to call a dehydration error. So we need to talk about what each one of these are. So the sodium and the acid error. Let's kind of start with that one first first. So what you're going to find out when you use pH probes in a real working laboratory, uh, there's going to be times that we're going to be having to obtain a pH of a liquid solution that might not just be in water, right? Uh, that's kind of one of the things that we saw last time. And we said, you know, gunk and oils and greases can gunk up that sole gel layer and we have to clean it off. Well, that's kind of what this sodium or acid error is referring to. But with this one, these typically are going to be in water environments. The problem here, though, is that those aqueous solutions are going to have very high concentrations of sodium or they have very high concentrations of of hydrogen. And these are things that we want to pay careful attention to in a laboratory because either one of these can cause me a problem. So let's talk about why. You know, why these two things? Out of everything, these two weird little things are going to cause me problems with the pH probe? And the answer is, yeah, it does. So we've already went through this discussion about the end of the pH probe. And what did I say? I said the end of the pH probe has this like jelly-like material in the bottom. Bottom, and that jelly-like material is something that we call the soul gel layer, right? And uh, if you go back and remember how we described this soul gel layer, uh, I kind of described it as this lattice, right? And this lattice is like Home Depot and Lowe's. Yeah, I remember that. And there's little openings in there, and those openings were filled with what? Ding, 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 ding. They are filled with sodium and hydrogens, right? So we talked about this idea that sodium is on the inside of the cell gel layer, loaded at 25%, and then that sodium is going to exchange with the hydrogen that it might find out in solution, and we get this kind of travel that begins to take place between the two, which generates a potential difference that sends a voltage up through my silver wire in the galvanic cell that we call a pH probe. Look at how how fancy we got just now, right? Uh, so with that said, if you have a solution that has extremely high levels of hydrogen, so we're talking about very acidic solutions here, then you have a problem. And what can happen is that all of the hydrogens can overload this soul gel layer. I mean, it just swamps that soul gel and just completely maxes it out. And when we completely max it out, we get problems because we'll measure a pH up to a certain point, but we really can't go any further than that because our cell gel is already taken up, right? It's like, no vacancy, please. Nothing here. Go on. Wilmington's full. Leland's full. Go on up maybe to Winston-Salem or even better yet, go into a different state. Uh, so that's kind of the idea that we have here with very high hydrogen content. And then the same thing happens with sodium as well. So for instance, if I make a super concentrated, just something like a salt solution, that's all that this is going to take, and salt is in ACL. So if I just take a bunch of salt and dissolve it in water and then dunk my pH probe in it, I'm going to find that my pH probe is not going to respond very well. And the reason is because all of this sodium swamp. Uh, the soul gel layer, just like the hydrogen did. So the sodium, just no vacancy in the soul gel. It weirds out my probe. It gives me a strange value. And there's nothing that we can actually do to fix those problems unless we order a special probe for that. So for instance, if I am working in the food industry and we have very heavy salt concentrations of solutions that we want to measure, then maybe 
I need to order a special pH probe that can handle those very heavy sodium concentrations. The same thing happens in the acid world. What if I'm working for maybe a company here in Castle Hain that we have that kind of generates and makes and uses their own somewhat like chromic acid or sulfuric acid, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, those people will have to maybe do some pH values of their samples and solutions. Or if I'm working in a laboratory, maybe it's a random sample that someone has sent to me and they want our company to measure the pH of those solutions. If they are strongly acidic, then we have a problem and we want to make sure that we have a correct probe in order to measure those solutions with. So this goes back to this whole concept that pH probes have ranges. And that range is going to tell you a minimum and a maximum. And you want to make sure that you keep that in mind as you use these pH probes in a real lab. Sometimes we have probes that are dedicated, and that's one of the reasons, because we know we commonly get a sample that's kind of a weirdo, and we're going to have to take that sample and treat it a little differently, and that might require a different type of probe to get that finished. All right. Uh, next is an equilibrium error. So this is a number two thing that we might experience in a lab. And this whole concept sounds fancy. Oh, your pH probe has an equilibrium error. Well, all that we're kind of saying is that that pH probe needs a little bit of time, right? So imagine, you know, middle age and you're getting up out of the chair or you're getting up off the sofa or out of the bed. Things just take a little bit more time in order to work, right? Uh, versus when you were spunky 16 and you're ready to go all night, right? So this equilibrium error can cause us a problem, and we just need to give the probe a little bit of time to settle down. We need to give the probe time to come to equilibrium where the sodium and the hydrogen is exchanging, and the best way to solve this problem is just be patient right? So this is often why we say stick the probe down into your solution and do not read the pH value on the screen immediately. And your probes actually have a lot of times this little built in. Ours has this cute little smiley face and it says, I'm happy. Yay. Well, it's giving you the equilibrium time that's needed for that probe to settle down. And, you know, sometimes this takes a little bit longer than others. It depends on how drastic of a change the pH measurement gets. So the water that it has to reach, um, let's say that we're measuring pH of 7, pH of 3, or pH of 7, pH of 8, pH of 9, pH of 7, pH of 8, and then all of a sudden we get a pH 3, then the probe is going to have to reach on the other end from where it was. So that takes a little bit of time. It doesn't do it instantaneously. So be patient. That's the best way to fix that problem. And we often say, you know, wait uh, 30 seconds or so before you take a measurement. And that 30 seconds is built into most pH probes because that is when they give you this little tiny happy face uh, on your pH meters. Or sometimes it will actually just be boring and it will just say, okay, and then that's all that it will do. Sometimes it just gives you a little dot and it just imagines that you know what that dot's supposed to be and most people don't even pay attention to it that it's even there um so uh, again that depends on the manufacturer it depends on how the meter's made but 30 seconds be patient before you take the measurement uh, finally hydration error is going to be number three on this list uh, this is another common problem that we can prevent and that we can fix that happens all the time if you're not careful and the hydration error, well, if you are hydrated for the winter, then that means your skin doesn't dry out and flake like a nasty snake or something like that, right? So we often slather moisturizer all over ourselves and lotions and grease-based formulas in order to make us feel really good and really pretty. Uh, well, the hydration error can happen in pH probes too. And the hydration error is basically related to hydration, moisture. Yeah, it does. So you want to prevent your probe 
from drying out. And that's what a hydration error is all about. So let's say that I go in one day, I use a probe, and then we just hired someone that was using the probe too, and it was working great. And then that person, when they got finished with it, did not put it back into the storage solution. They just left it out overnight. Well, the next day that we come in to use that probe and I look at that probe and I see that it's just kind of hanging out on the holder, then that's going to make me really angry because that $700, if not more of a probe that you just maybe messed up. So why didn't you put it in the pH buffer four in order to store it, right? That's kind of what this hydration error is all about. So if the end does dry out, there is a cross your fingers way to fix that and that is to put it back into pH buffer four and sometimes this will take up to 24 hours in order to fix that problem. So what we're hoping is that this sole gel layer, which is kind of like jello in a way, right? Uh, it doesn't need to dry out, and if it does dry out, it gets all crispy, and it gets all flaky, and it can get brittle, and it can flake off, and we don't want that to have a really good probe. So if we can maybe salvage that and just dunk it back down into our buffer solution and keep it there undisturbed, don't touch it, just allow it to that moisture right on up right i mean we're putting it in ph buffer four there's a lot of water there there's a lot of things that can make it plump back up just like normal then maybe we can get this probe working again so that is the problem with the hydration errors uh that's also how we can fix it equilibration error needs a little bit of time and then never ever put it in really high sodium content or what we call strong acids that have a lot of hydrogen that can interfere with these measurements. All right. Uh, so now that we're kind of at this point, I think that we're somewhat finished talking about the probe and, and the things that can go on with it and some of the errors that we can see and how to fix these. I want to show you one of the first pH meters that was kind of out on the market. So this dates all the way back to the 1930s. And this is one of our first pH meters called the Beckman G. Um, and it doesn't really look like any of the pH meters that we have today in our lab, right? Uh, first off, I'm kind of jealous because this looks like a clunky wooden box. And, you know, I get jealous with that because it's almost like antique -y, but you're not going to find anything made like that anymore in a laboratory. And I guarantee you that that wooden box today is still intact. It's still solid. It's still probably pretty heavy, uh, but it has upheld the, uh, you know, father time or mother time, whatever kind of role you want to put on Mr. or Mrs. Time. Uh, and uh, these things are probably worth quite a bit of money nowadays. Uh, but these are what kind of the first pH meters uh, look like. And these were not commendation probes, uh, unlike kind of what we use today, right? Uh, and the reason that I know that is because if you look here at the front of this instrument, you're going to see two wires that come out. And then one is going to kind of gravitate here to the left and one is going to be gravitating there to the right. So what this actually error is or area is, is my IRE and my ERE. So this is one of the reference uh, probes and this is the ion selective probe uh, that the pH meters were built like that back in the day. So what would happen is that my external reference, I would put that into something like a pH buffer of seven, uh, some kind of standard solution that I know what it should be. And then here up at the top, I'll see this analog meter with some knobs and I would adjust that readout to make sure that that reading is actually proper where it's supposed to be. And that gives me kind of like a baseline. It almost like tears the machine in a way where I'm telling the instrument, okay, this is what this buffer is supposed to be. And then here is the readout that you're getting. And I can visually look at that and see if it makes sense or not. And then the other probe is the ion selective. That's the one that would go into my samples. Um, and I would kind of watch that little analog meter, read that needle. Hopefully I would be able to read that scale the proper way. I would read that meter as it would bounce back and forth. Um, and I would record the pH or the estimate of the pH that I would see 
on that little bitty box that we call the Beckman G. As you can imagine, there's so many problems here, right? Uh, the problems is the external probe. Uh, that is not really um, kind of uh, something that can be controlled quite well if you're not very careful. The on selective probe, the same kind of thing is going to go on there. What type of solutions are you putting them in for the reference standards? Uh, how are you reading the meter? Are you making accidents? Did you kind of bounce it off the right way when you try to zero it out, uh, so to speak? So these were problems that the Beckman G began to give people. And then we knew sooner or later this was going to have to change. But based on the technology back in the day. I mean, this was great. It was a step in the right direction. Um, here is actually an older advertisement dated 1936 uh, on our first pH meters uh, that we were actually not calling pH meters. Uh, what we were calling these were acidometers. Hey, look how fancy we got back in the day. Um, and uh, acidometers make you think of acid. So you probably had those people out there, well, what about basimeters, right? If this is going to be measuring acids, what about the bases? And we're like, well, we can do that too with this. Uh, so maybe acidometer was not the appropriate term to use. And over a course of time, that name has been dropped, of course. Uh, and now we just call it pH meter. Uh, but notice the advertisement says, now the new portable direct reading glass electrode. It is simple. Well, uh, it doesn't look simple to me. It's compact. It's this huge, big, clunky box with a lot of these extra little widgets and gadgets on them, right? It's not compact. It's accurate. Uh, well, I'm expecting somebody to read off of an analog meter. How accurate can you get? I hope you can get close, but, you know, compared to today's standards, <laughs> this is accurate. <laughs> Uh, speedy! Um, no, nah, probably not. There's a lot of knobs, twists, and turns that I'm going to have to do in order to make the measurement with. Uh, so again, compared to today, that's probably not speedy. It's rugged! And that probably is true. I mean, again, it's in these wooden boxes that's probably uh, stood the test of time uh, and uh, probably still working. I wouldn't doubt it uh, in today's environment. And economical! Uh, so maybe they are affordable. Maybe it's easy to obtain for a laboratory to get them and use them uh, and easy for maybe someone to be trained on them the proper way. Uh, up in the top of the lid, you'll often see an area up here that gave people a reference to what an acid was and what a base was. What does pH lower than 7 mean? What does pH greater than 7 mean? Uh, that was all kind of built into the lid um, and directions on how to actually use it as well. Step-by-step -step SOPs uh, that we could read and follow in order to make sure that we were using that the right way. All right. Uh, so, uh, of course, we don't have anything like this today, right? Uh, not in our lab, at least. Um, so uh, this, these pH meters have became much more complicated, much more computer friendly, software friendly. Um, a lot of the electronics have changed, of course, in them. Um, and now they are simpler than what is here. They are more compact than what was here. They are more accurate than what was here. The whole pH meter field has drastically improved since the 1930s and 1940s, and of course it should have, right? Um, so what we have in our laboratory, uh, maybe not what you'll use in the very beginning, but we do have these, um, are VWR pH meters, um, and we actually have the bigger water meter that is here, so there we go, uh, and that bigger water meter is built uh, to go a little bit better than what you're seeing in our prep room areas with more of our what we would call teaching pH meters. Um, you know, instruments that we would like for you to use. If you mess them up, it's not a big deal. They're not crazy expensive. Uh, but it still gives you the idea that you're using real pH meters. And you are using real pH meters. Uh, but we do have some that are even better than those in our prep room area. All right. Uh, so these uh, symphony meters, uh, we have a handful of these. I would say three or four. We keep them stored away in a cabinet. Uh, that way we can pull them out whenever we need to use them. And they're not out just kind of getting used by people um, because we don't want the abuse on them. They are way more expensive. They are a little bit more temperamental. Um, and uh, they don't really take lightly to people that don't know how to handle the probes. Um, but with these pH meters, uh, they are a little bit more money. So this is for the box only. This 430 bucks is just for the meter part. 
And that meter, of course, like everything else, is going to have to have a probe that you're going to have to connect to them. Um, and that probe is going to be even more money. So that probe could easily be another three, four hundred dollars, depending on what you need. So now we are approaching our one thousand ching dollar mark on our pH meters and pH probe set. Um, and that's why we often will hoard these back into a cabinet and only bring them out when we absolutely need them. So why would we need these over what we have in our prep room? Uh, well, first, the range is a little bit better on these. And I want you to look at the range here. It goes negative two on our pH scale. So these pH meters, and if we order the proper probes that go along with them, these probes in the meters can read down into the negatives of pH. So super, super acids can be analyzed here without a too big of an issue. And then it also goes all the way up to 20. So uh, what we're seeing actually, though, is that even some of the cheaper run-of-the-mill pH meters that you can find off of Amazon will go that range without a problem. This used to be somewhat special back in the day, but the technology has gotten to the point that any run-of-the-mill pH manufacturer can get that type of range and not really cost you an arm and a leg on those. What really sets this apart, though, versus those kind of uh, cheaper versions of an Amazon pH meter are the accuracies and the resolutions that we see with our VWR pH meters. So our accuracy here actually goes down to 0.002. So that means what you're seeing on the screen right now is two digits after the decimal on these pH reads. That is what most people do when they report pH. They report pH with two decimal places almost every single time. But just like with a balance, we have a button on these pH meters that we can force it to give us a readout with three digits instead of two digits. And some of our balances are made that way too, right? Some of our balances, they have three digits after the decimal and we can force it to read four digits and go back and forth that way. Uh, pH meters here, same kind of thing. So if I need it, I can make this go even lower in our lab and we can go to those three digit readouts. And that also means that the resolution here on this pH meter is 0.001. So that resolution is telling me how many decimal places can the machine give me as a readout. We can get three decimals from ours. Uh, how accurate is it? Well, if you do go that low, then your accuracy is plus or minus 0.002. So what that means is that if I put this into a solution and I got a pH of 7.518, uh, how good is that pH meter? Well, that pH meter is telling you we are accurate to plus or minus 0 0.002. So let's take 0 0.002 minus that number. So that means that this readout is actually 7.516 and we can go all the way up to 7.520, all right? So that pH meter is saying, listen, here's the readout that we're providing you right there, 7.518. But when you take this reading, we need you to understand that the true value could actually be within 7.520 down to 7.516. And folks, that's super tight. Uh, there's hardly any wiggle room that's there with these VWR meters, and there's some that are actually even better than this. Um, so these are more of what I would call our industrial pharmaceutical top grade pH meters that are out there in our lab um, that you might not even see. Who knows? Uh, but we do have that capability and we can use them when we need them. All right. Okay, so uh, with that said, that's kind of my story with pH meters and, and pH probes. And I kind of want to give you a quick rundown of just more uh, verbiage of the pH world and acids and bases um, and kind of dabble a little bit into the theory part of that, which really we haven't really tackled. So I probably have one or two more videos that I can kind of pop out of me uh, and uh, come back and we'll pick up from there and we'll continue on with this discussion. So a little bit of terminology left, um, some definitions, uh, but pretty much that's about it.